Don't clap so early. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out uh, in the late afternoon of the, uh, on the second day of the conference. It's been long days, I assume, a lot of uh, very detailed content and so on. Um, I will talk about, I would say, a topic which, is, which I see popping up at quite a few customers right now that are that made their first steps towards clouds and microservices and now want to grow further. They go for hybrid clouds and I will talk a little bit about my experiences and my ideas, how to work in this area um, with regards to software architecture. So a first disclaimer, I will not deliver any rocket science at all to you. Uh, so I will talk a lot about software architecture, a few architecture principles. We will not go down extremely technical. This is a talk mostly focused about software architecture. So sorry, no rocket science uh, if you expected that. Um, now, when I approach this topic um, with regards to uh, hybrid clouds, um, I usually see with my customers quite a few, I would say, quite standardized questions popping up every, every time. So the first one is, what does that actually mean, hybrid cloud? I mean, if you do a Google search, you will find a lot of content about that, but mostly from an infrastructure or vendor kind of point of view. Um, I have uh, summarized for you a few of the options that you usually see out in the wild regarding that. The next one is, um, what do you need to do uh, in order to make your software, I would say, you can call it cloud native, flexible, cloud agnostic, but how can you make sure that you can move your software from one cloud to another, if that's an option. The next one is, and that's a, a quite an interesting topic in terms of microservices. If you go for microservices or self-contained systems, may that be another driver for cutting your microservices in terms of business capabilities and stuff like that. And then, of course, a quite a heated topic is a, to a, cl a classic, the in integration. How do I work with integration in such a scenario? And especially with regards to existing systems. Uh, if you have a grown legacy application landscape and you go, let's say, with an on-premise or a public cloud offering, how do you integrate those? Do you offer them to the public cloud or would you want to do that? Who can be drivers for that and so on? And this is uh, the stuff I'm going to talk about. So this is about software architecture and not about infrastructure. Because in terms of infrastructure, I would be a totally wrong speaker for that. There are folks out there that know a million times more about that stuff than I do. So I focus on your software. So let's start with the first, uh, with the first ter term. Um, what can that mean? I made up a couple of scenarios um, that would fit into this topic. So an easy scenario is that you work on premise in your own data data, but you use uh, different cloud offerings. So you work, for instance, you have a Cloud Foundry installation and let's say an OpenShift or a Kubernetes uh, installation running on premise in your own data center. Quite an easy thing. The next one brings in a lot of legacy systems. So um, this is something you very often see when, when you're around in an environment that talks a lot about two-speed ITs and stuff like that. There is a big grown uh, legacy application landscape hosted on, let's say, host machines or stuff like that in a classical operating and stuff like that. And this needs to be combined with the, uh, th with the newer cloud offerings. Um, the next scenario which combines on-premise and public cloud offerings is one that I see very often right now with many customers as a second step. So a lot of especially larger enterprises started off with the cloud topic with an on-premise offering. So they, let's say they ramped up an OpenShift installation or a Cloud Foundry installation in their own data center. And of course, many projects jump chip they, they released their first software, they had their first success stories, and now everyone wants more. Uh, 
And so there is now an opening towards public cloud offerings. And this needs to be combined in a certain way. And um, the next one is you don't go on-premise at all, but you're in an organization where you have different cloud offerings. So you work with AWS, you work with Azure, with Bluemix or something like that. And this is mostly a scenario that you will find uh, which is driven by various organization units. Let's say the, the German unit goes for Asha, and uh, the SE or the international unit goes for AWS. This is something that I very often see driven by organizational things. So one very important side note. Um, usually, you don't want to be in that scenario. So basically, things are way easier if you just stick to one cloud offering, if you're either purely on-premise, purely public, and if you don't mix things up. Ob obviously, that makes life very much easier. But uh, on the other hand, of course, we can't influence everything. Now, the general challenges um, that I see in many discussions are around latency, data, and security. Um, latency? is very much a topic if I change between an on-premise offering and a public cloud offering. Of course, like going from your own data center to the outside world gives you a very big difference in latency. You can uh, compare that with the German autobahn. Um, if you go to, a, let's say, in Austria, they have a speed limit on the autobahn. So the speed difference between the cars on the autobahn is not as high as on the German one because there can be a car with 100 kilometers an hour and then you have the Porsche with 250 kilometers an hour, which is quite a big gap. And you obviously need to manage that on the roads in Germany, because otherwise you will be in a pretty bad situation. The next one is, in my eyes, one of the key drivers that drives many organizations towards that scenario that is data. Why do many organizations work with on-premise clouds? Is because of data protection, I would say internal regulations, external regulations, and they, they often want to differ. What kind of data do I want to keep inside my own data center? And what kind of data do I want to store or process in an external kind of data center? And um, this is a driver, but you need to address that because you want to comply with the rules of your organization. And then, of course, the last one is security. You need to hook this up in order to, order to get a holistic um, implementation um, of security. Now, let's dig a little bit into the software architecture thing. Now, you're faced with one of those scenarios. I would say uh, my main example throughout my talk today will be a mixture of an on-premise and a public cloud offering, because that's the thing that I see most often in organizations. Let me um, quickly ask you, who is confronted with an offering of on-premise and public cloud offerings around there? Okay, okay, okay. Um, who is completely public cloud, but who has uh, a, various, a variation of cloud offerings you're working with? Yeah, quite a few folks. And who are running with various, I would say, cloud platforms uh, on-premise? Yeah, also a couple of folks, yeah. But I would say most of the folks that raised their hands uh, were mixed up between on-premise and public cloud offerings. So um, now one thing that I see with many customers right now is that they started off on-premise, but they want to go for an on, uh, I would say, public cloud offering. Now, one thing that would be very easy in terms of independence would be pack everything into a container, dockerize everything and have the container like being managed left and forth. That's one thing. But that's, I would say, a rather I infrastructure driven thing. Let me look a little bit about the software architecture. In terms of the independence, um, I see three steps. One is ISA, which is a rather new principle surrounding microservices, independent system architecture. The next one I call uh, choose your features wisely, which means, um, which is a little bit about vendor specific features, how you use them in your software architecture. And then, of course, the 12 factors. Um, 
I assume most of you are quite familiar with that, and a few of you are obviously aware that in, in such a scenario, you need to be a little bit careful in terms of the features that you adopt in your software architecture. But let me quickly go over all of them. ISA is, I would say, a principle um, which uh, we from InnoQ, um, I would say, sort of put out and proposed and discussed with many stakeholders from the industry. And um, it's basically a collection of best practices for microservice architectures and self-contained systems. The, the stuff itself is publicly available, um, also uh, open sourced for everyone. And ISA runs on uh, 12 principles. So, uh, no, it's nine, sorry. Um, the first thing is pack your software as modules that expose standardized interfaces. So, nothing uh, really special there. The other one is you want to pack your software or those modules either in containers, processes, or other virtual machines, like you could dockerize your application, or you could uh, work with a model that is very similar to Spring Boot, where you have it as a process with the Java minus jar kind of startup thing. Um, the next one is think very clearly, and this is a very important thing, especially when you talk about hybrid cloud scenarios. Think very carefully about your micro and macro architecture decisions. Macro architecture are decisions that you want to make across all of your microservices, such as how do I want to communicate with each other? How do I want to deal with resilience? Um, how do I work with certain parts of securities? How do you work with service discovery if you want to do if you want to use that? And that's a macro decision. And this should be, I would say, global, but it should be very small and very tiny in order to allow independence for teams. Now, a very important macro architecture decision in a hybrid cloud scenario, obviously, is how do I want to communicate across the boundaries of various cloud offerings? Do you want to differ there, or do you want to treat everything the same? Microarchitecture, on the one hand, is the freedom for your team kind of part. So you, that's up to the teams that implement the software. This is, in terms of hybrid cloud architectures, not so interesting. But the macro part is important in my eyes. The next one is you obviously want to work with a limited set of integration of options, such as RESTful HTTP, messaging, and stuff like that. Then also communication, I want to uh, establish a few standards. Now, those last three things, macro and microarchitecture, communication and integration, are very important drivers for a hybrid cloud scenario, obviously. Um, then you want uh, independent continuous delivery pipelines. It's part of the ISA thing, but not so central to the hybrid cloud scenario. You want to standardize on operations. Now, do you want to divide your operations by on-premise and public cloud offering? Obviously, you probably don't want to do that. You want to consolidate everything on an alerting side, on a logging side, um, on a metric side, and, and things like that, log aggregation. And you still want to standardize on the interfaces with that. So, Please don't uh, go ahead and make a macro architecture for a certain logging framework or something like that. Don't make a macro architecture decision for, I would say, I would say implementation details of data structures. Standardize the interfaces. How do you want to log things? And give the freedom to the teams in terms of the implementations, how you write your logs, use logback or whatever for that. And you want to, tr to work with resilience in there. And resilience is, spe is especially important, again, at the gap between the two cloud offerings, on-premise and public cloud. Now, the next thing is uh, choose your features wisely. Be aware. If you, for instance, go ahead and use the shiny, fancy new toys, such as Amazon Lambda, serverless, and so, st and so on, you lock yourself into a certain cloud platform. And if you want to be flexible across various platforms, you must be aware of that. I mean, as nice as this stuff is, it's shiny, it's fancy, it's awesome, it's really great. But 
you are totally locked into one platform right now. And this is something you need to treat very carefully. And many of the cloud vendors on the public side, they try to move you to their features. They want you to be there because it's harder to leave after you're committed to them. So be aware if a dynamic moving between various cloud offerings is a thing for you. If um, you want to move from, let's say, public to on-premise and back. So I would say the movement that I usually see is from an on-premise cloud towards the public. I rarely see like someone going from public to on-premise, but I mean, sometimes it may happen. And if you're suddenly stuck with a certain AWS or Azure feature, you need to work your way around that. The next thing in terms of the independence are the 12 factors. I assume that most of you folks who have heard all these very extremely detailed and technical talks and so on have already heard something about the 12 factors defined by Heroku. So they, are, they were basically the first principles for cloud agnostic platforms, especially with a focus on SaaS apps, but they deliver a very clean contract for maximum portability. Um, I will not go into a lot of detail on them, just mind that this is really important if you want to move between various cloud platforms. So code base inversion controls, explicit dependencies, externalize your configuration. This is in my eyes one of the most important things when you want to be independent, if you want to run on Cloud Foundry, if you want then to put your application in a Docker container or stuff like that. Externalize, being able to externalize all your configuration makes your life ways, ways easier. Then treat, uh, work with backing services, separate build, release, run, um, pack your application in a process that goes hand in hand with the ISA principle again, work with port binding, scale out via the, um, the, the process model, work with quick startups, short run times, have a dev prop parity, treat your logs as a stream of events, and that's very interesting. Again, standardize on the interface, and then consolidate everything. Do not force your folks into a specific framework for that, and work with externalized admin processes. So I don't want to waste a lot of time uh, on this, obviously, because this is quite old, and I assume most of you folks know that. So in terms of independence, you should keep an eye on those things. Um, now, one thing is um, cutting microservices along um, business capabilities and aligning an organization with that is obviously a good idea. I think the microservices community has been quite successful um, or had a very close eye on doing that um, in the past. Um, I will briefly go into one thing that can help you with that a little bit which is the bounded context. I mean, every sophisticated subdomain consists of a bounded context. The bounded context is apart from domain-driven design. This is not going to be a lot about domain-driven design, but I think the cutting in terms of a bounded context is an important thing because we suddenly, in a hybrid cloud scenario, have a very strong new driver for those things. Because you should think which business capabilities you want to have on a public cloud offering, and how about, um, I would say, a public, uh, a, a view about your business model, which is okay to be in a public cloud offering? And may there be a new confidential view about your business model, which you want to keep on the internal cloud? So there, there comes in a very strong new driver. Just a brief thing for those that don't know what a bounded context is. In my eyes, the most important thing about the bounded context is this, is this sentence down there. It's the boundary around the meaning of a given model. So let's briefly look at uh, the micro exchange here. So, the very nice folks that organize the microexchange uh, conference and that do a, a really great job there, they, they, let's say they work with three bounded contexts, three microservices. Reservations, event management, and badges. So reservations, if we have a customer there, um, can have a very easy CRM-like model standard kind of thing. But in terms of the event management, maybe you've seen the awesome vegetarian food they had. So they took a lot of care uh, for the vegetarian and vegan audience here. Um, 
you want to manage that. How many vegetarians, how many vegans, how many meat, eater, uh, meat eaters do you have? Uh, and who wants to hear which session? So is the model of a customer in the event management context the same as a customer uh, in the reservation context? Obviously not. It's like uh, a list, a, a, a number-based model. And now with the badges, those things here, um, we can work with a different model here. Of course, the name is the same in a cent centralized world. Um, I would say that needs to be totally in sync with the stuff in there. Well, it should obviously be in sync, but um, you can make an educated decision if you want to split up. Now, one approach uh, for uh, cutting those things, sorry, I did a quick screw up, is thinking about the bounded context as a system boundary. And um, that means um, we define units for deployment, availability, scalability, and so on and so forth. Now, especially security, data protection, and stuff like that, can be a major driver for cutting a system into two parts that you would, I would say, in a single cloud scenario, half as one part. But there is this area of data, there's this area of processing logic. And very often it's not just about data, it's also about algorithms that you want to keep internally to you. Um, that may, want, may call in such a scenario for a cutting in, in things. So if we usually consider things, there's four things. The domain model, use cases, quality goals, and organizational aspects. In terms of the domain model, I would say we don't have a very strong driver in the hybrid cloud environment. That is usually the same business, the same thing that you look when you do your business analysis. Process ownership can be interesting. Maybe you have external processes like sales funnels and stuff like that, and internal processes, and you want to suddenly split them up in order to host one thing globally distributed on an external cloud offering, and the rest you want to keep internal because you want to keep secrets and you are very, I would say, picky on what you have in there. That can be interesting. The major driver in my eyes in a hybrid cloud scenario are quality goals. And one quality goal, obviously it's not time to market, but it's about data, algorithms, and so on. And this can be a key driver uh, for you to split up your logic into things. And obviously organizational constraints. Eventually, especially when you have multiple public cloud offerings, those are very often driven on an organizational level. And you want to split those things up because one organization forces you and you have no way to, to deal your way around that to work on that offering and the other organizational unit really forces you in going the other way around. Of course, on a technical level, we know, well, um, that's not the best idea, but as software architects and developers, we can't change everything. We have to accept those things as drivers for our architecture. So that can be a thing as well. However, it's driven by the four things at the same time. In extremely rare cases, only one of them is a really strong driver. Mostly it's multiple forces working on your domain model. So the next thing, what do we want to consider in terms of uh, integration and communication in a hybrid cloud scenario. Again, there I will briefly address one DDD construct, the context map, because it's very interesting. It features a couple of patterns that you usually find in, in legacy software, but not all of those. And I've seen context maps being discussed a lot also in a microservices context, and um, not all of them will be suitable for you in a hybrid cloud scenario. Of course, some of them aren't even a good idea for microservices, but the context map is also a very good starting point for moving towards a hybrid cloud scenario if you have to, because you can make complexity explicitly visible. Now, the share kernel, this is where you really share stuff on a physical level, shared database, shared jar files or, so, or something like that, obviously. Not a good idea to do that in a hybrid cloud scenario. Customer supplier is where one team takes a strong influence about the interface and the model of another team providing functionality. Well, um, 
typical thing, interface discussions, and so on and so forth. Yeah, sometimes okay, but I wouldn't have that as a major pattern, especially on the brink between two cloud scenarios. <laughs> The conformist is where one team really conforms themselves to an external model. So they totally bind themselves to that. Not, so, not such a good idea. The next one is interesting, however. I really take in an external model and I transform it to a new internal view. That's a good idea to do. I will get back to that later on. Next thing is you totally decouple. You work with eventually organizational solutions. I mean, yes, we want to automate everything. We want the perfect integration. But sometimes as a first step, especially in such hybrid cloud scenarios, I could think is may there be an organizational solution that I don't need to do a lot of fine-grained um, uh, and risky uh, integration. Good idea to do that. The next one goes hand in hand with our ISA principles. We want to have modules that provide interfaces, be it like a RESTful resource or something like that, but it can also be domain events, HTTP feeds, or something like that. So a very good idea. And what I like a lot about the context map patterns is the published language. Think about the ISBN number. If you work with books, Every book has an ISBN number. Now, is there an ISBN library out there? No, it's not. There is no, let's say, Java module that implements the ISBN or a credit card number or something like that. But there is a glossary for that. There is a description, how it's supposed to look, what the semantics are, if there's checksums and so on, how it works. And every system that deals with books implements it according to that language, which is a published language. That's a really interesting thing as well in terms of decoupling. So in my eyes, that's suitable. To sum that up in a hybrid cloud scenario, anti-corruption layer is a very good uh, thing for integration, especially when you work with legacy systems. Do you want to tie your, um, I would say, jumping from a virtualized uh, uh, or a uh, Cloud Foundry based microservices architecture to your, let's say, old school world? And do you want to tie that very closely together? No. You obviously want to have a, something in between the two. I always talk about an anti corruption microservices, and I, I will come back to that later on as well. Separate ways is really good. Uh, but can sometimes just not be a realistic solution because we, you just need a perfect integration between things. Open host service, really good. Expose interfaces and published language is the maximum decoupling. Very good idea. Now in terms of uh, integration technologies, the, I would say the typical um, suspects for that are of course RESTful HTTP. On a synchronous way, this is a, real, uh, this is a totally good idea to do inside a cloud. But do you want to have many synchronous calls? Going over cloud boundaries? Ooh. Eventually not. Messaging is the next thing. I, if I look through the agenda of the conference, I see many talks about reactive systems. There was a domain events uh, workshop today, so event-based architectures are a really interesting thing. Yes, that's really good. There are very capable message brokers out there. But if you look about um, hybrid clouds, um, and you hook them up with a message broker. Where do you pr place the message broker? Who has the ownership over the message broker? And if the message broker works over, let's say, proprietary APIs and ports, you always have to fight with the firewall team in order to get from A to B. Good stuff, very capable, but please be aware that this may be a risk. The next point that I will do is could actually also be a, a subpart of that, but I wanted to make it a little bit more explicit. HTTP feeds can be a very handy helper in those solutions. Because usually with HTTP, we can always go from A to B. It usually works in most firewalls. Um, it's easy to open them up. And um, there is a thing called Atom. So you could eventually work with Atom-based feeds on the boundary from your public cloud offering to your on-premise cloud. So you pull the stuff 
And you work with, I would say, what I, what I, I like the term planned consistency. Like every 10 seconds, you pull in the new stuff from the public cloud. So you're not bound in terms of timeouts, um, downtimes, and so on in a live manner, like in a synchronous interface. It's sort of something like a very asynchronous HTTP thing. Very good fit in my eyes, especially in this scenario. And finally, we have the good old web services, the SOAP thing. Wouldn't be my first class candidate, obviously, but you wouldn't be, you usually won't be able to avoid it if you um, deal uh, with legacy integrations. I would wrap those things in something that I call my, um, how did I call it, the anti-corruption uh, microservice. Uh, just uh, a, a quick question in the audience. Um, if you look, if you work in a hybrid cloud solution, who works with uh, synchronous HTTP RESTful calls uh, from on-premise to public or from public to on-premise? Could anyone give me a hand on that? You do? Okay. Uh, what about messaging between the two? Asynchronous messaging, like your rabbits, Kafka's, and so on. Yeah, quite a few. Who work with HTTP feeds? Okay. And web service, anyone? Well, yeah, okay. Um, another question, who, wants, who avoids, who hasn't integrated their on-premise and cloud offerings, uh, and public cloud offerings at all? Okay. No one. So there is some sort of a uh, communication, and you see you have a very diverse set of those communications. So in my eyes, it's really important. Don't show or don't prove that you know all of them. Make wise macro architecture decisions what, what you want to do on the edge of those clouds. Now, what about um, legacy integration? Um, the last question that I had in my, in my question list. How do I deal with that? How do I deal with existing legacy systems? How do I integrate them? Do, do I want them to make them publicly available? Your security officers will tell you, hell no. Of course not. They need to be uh, very hidden in the back end of the back ends of the back ends of your uh, internal on-premise uh, way. So if we have a, a way of communicating. Um, we see this legacy system out, out there. That's our old school system, uh, written in good old COBOL, hosted on a host machine, but it exposes some web services. So one thing that I would always do in, the, in those worlds is I would create a dedicated anti-corruption layer just for it. And the idea of that is, in most cases, so for instance, I have a couple of customers, those systems have very detailed, very fine-grained interfaces. So you, you need to know a lot of the innards of the domain model of the given system in order to integrate it. And they have very slow release cycles, usually two or three releases a year. I would say that's not our goal in a microservices architecture. If that would be our goal, microservices would be the wrong choice, I think. Um, we can life, make life ways easier other ways. So we want to be quite fast over there. So by not coupling every of your microservices on your on-premise cloud directly to the legacy system, um, one way of doing that is an anti-corruption layer that consolidates interfaces that can, for instance, pull the legacy system for data and publish domain events out there. So you can publish events, so you can work with event-driven architecture, even if this thing down there doesn't know domain events at all. One way of doing that. You can do protocol transformations and so on. And this can also be a gateway if for the outside world, if you want to go outside. Now, if we go to the public cloud offering, I am quite a bit of a fan of HTTP feeds. So I pull feeds from the public cloud offering and I process them internally because um, it's, uh, I'm not bound to any latency differences here. 
eventually they are not a problem if you're in the same region or uh, even I would say hosted very closely together that shouldn't be a very big problem but I think they show up a very good and a very nice way to decouple those things and internally you can make a nice uh, micro architecture decision that you either work with like message brokers or HTTP communication and so on. Now to summarize those things um, before I get into uh, questions and, uh, and hopefully answers from my side, um, one thing I would take a very close look at is a thing I call uh, or uh, we often refer to as marker architecture. I think you need to make a decision for communication inside of one of those cloud platforms. How do you want to communicate there? What do you, what do you want, what do you allow your teams to do inside of that platform? That's the one thing. The next dedicated decision I would want to make in, in a hybrid cloud scenario is, how do I want to work um, in terms of communication between different cloud platforms? What do I allow there? Do I allow synchronous calls? Do I only want to work asynchronous? Um, how do I work with resilience in those cases? How do I want to work, handle that? Because I think you should very explicitly handle resilience in a careful manner at the, at the corner cases there. Um, how do you deal with security? Yes, there is. There are now a growing number of products and offerings by various cloud providers that pitch themselves in terms of the, the word hybrid cloud that offer you integrated security and um, uh, standardized handling in terms of uh, role management and stuff like that. Yes, that's good. But always evaluate those things in terms of vendor lock-in. How do you lock yourself in in terms of the vendor? So if you move somewhere else, can you take that with you? Or are you, again, locked in, at least with regards to one specific platform? Um, I would say HTTP is especially at the edge cases between an on-premise and a public cloud, a very good friend of yours, again, because there is something in there as well. And how do you want to integrate legacy software? Um, I think the anti corruption layer is a really good idea. In terms of microarchitecture, you standardize on the interfaces, on the macroarchitecture, but like logging framework, um, which system raises which alerts in which format is up to the system. Um, you in implementation languages, like the usual thing that we pitch microservices with, teams can work autonomously and can decide on their own how they want to handle things in terms of persistence and so on. It's totally up to the teams. Even in a hybrid thing, I wouldn't want to talk to them. In terms of persistence, also think about vendor-specific features, vendor lock-in. If you go for a cloud provider-specific database that only they provide, you're obviously bound to a certain degree to that database or data storage, obviously. Right. Um, that's it uh, from my side about the topic. We have, I think, 10 minutes for questions and um, hopefully answers. Um, are there any questions on that? Yes, there is one over there. Let me briefly wait for the microphone. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, you based your macro architecture decisions mostly on um, business um, mm -hmm. criteria, but if you had to base those decisions on technical decisions, especially during a transition mm -hmm. phase of the process, you are moving from a monolith that is on premises, you yeah. cannot put everything on a, a public cloud environment right from the mm -hmm. day one, so you need to move uh, mm -hmm. from one to, to, from A to B uh, smoothly. Yeah. How would you approach this? Okay, uh, very good question. Um, I think, um, first of all, I, I wouldn't base the macro architecture decisions solely on business things. Of course, business things have an, an impact on that, but a big part of macro architectural decisions are technical decisions. So, especially... I 
sorry. Uh, I, I thought um, you were mainly, or uh, mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's the main driver, okay. not just the only one. Okay. Um, Fair enough. Uh, so what I would do is, um, if you move or if you transform applications, let's say you have a monolith, you want to put it to the cloud. One of the first steps that I see with many customers, they cut out little pieces and put it on an on-premise cloud. That thing gets a little bit successful in the organization. They need more scalability, more capabilities. They move to a public cloud with that. Um, in terms of a macro architecture, um, I think uh, you should make a difference between two things there. One is the, the goal of the new runtime platform, how you want to integrate, how you want to work there. That's one part and one set of marker architecture decisions. And then I think you should also talk very closely with various stakeholders how you, want, how you actually want to transform things out. And I would actually separate that from the from the target marker architecture, that is in my eyes a transformation plan or uh, a way how to transform things. Which patterns do you use? How do you analyze the things? Just a hint, the context map is a really big helper on that. Um, and um, I would rather, um, I would actually make a difference between the target runtime platform on various cloud platforms and the way to get there. Because the, the, the target thing, will live on, and the other one will hopefully sometimes not be needed any longer. OK, okay. You. you're welcome. Any more questions? All right, so if there is no more questions, um, just a quick hint, um, you can follow me on Twitter. My name is at BitBoss, and um, I will publish the slides to that, I guess, in the train on my way back, so you should see a tweet uh, probably tonight with a link to the slides. Um, thank you very much for coming out. I hoped I managed to give you a few insights. Um, I'll be around at the InnoQ booth for a couple of, uh, I would say an hour approximately. So if you have any further questions, you can hit me up over there. Thanks for coming out. Enjoy the rest of the conference and a safe trip home tonight. Thanks. Thank